What's up guys, Jake here. For those of you who don't know me, I have a YouTube channel where I talk about finance and investing topics. And at the beginning of this year, as a challenge for fun, I decided to do a brokerage account challenge and document my progress. So on January 1st, I started with $25,000 and my goal by the end of the year was just to outperform a simple low cost uh, total stock market index fund by actively trading. So let me first share with you my results and then we'll get to the how and why. This is my Charles Schwab brokerage account. This is the one where I'm actually doing the challenge and documenting everything. So I can't add money. I started with $25,000 and I'm not allowed to add any more of my own personal money when I get paid. However, year to date, I'm up $21,943 or about 87%. And it's this point right here where I started buying call contracts. And ever since then, I've had pretty impressive results. I've also been buying the exact same call contracts in my Fidelity account. My Fidelity account, I've not been documenting, but when I get paid, I just add more money. So these jagged uplines is a payday in which I deposited more money. So I had about $32,000 uh, at the beginning of March, and that's when I started buying additional call contracts in this account, and in this account, I'm up about $32,000. If you wanna see my positions specifically, here is a screenshot of my account. I have call contracts on very well-known companies like Apple, Adobe, Costco, down here you have my, my total unrealized gains. I haven't sold to close anything yet, so that does make me a little bit nervous, but I have about $32,000 that I'm up on my cost basis in my Fidelity account. Add in the 21,000 from my Schwab account, and I'm up about $53,000 in just two months. So down in the comments section of my videos on my Burgage account challenge, I'm increasingly getting the question, Jake, how are you doing this? How did you do this? Can I do this too? And in this video, I'm gonna do my best to explain my, my system, my method for choosing which call contracts to buy. And can you do it too? I, I can't guarantee anything. On my channel, I'm not trying to sell you anything. I'm, I'm not promoting a course or a book. I'm not asking for your email. I'm not asking you to go down and click a link to sign up for two free stocks. Uh, on my channel, I just enjoy learning things and then explaining them to other people. Uh, I, I hope you the best. I wish you success with your finance and investing endeavors, but I give no guarantees. Now, the long answer to what I'm doing is part of this playlist. I've been documenting everything since January 1st, and I have a playlist of 37 videos. Now I know people don't want to binge this entire playlist, so I will attempt to condense it down to this single video. So I'm gonna try and cover a lot in a short amount of time, but if you want more details or further explanations, check out this playlist. And last year, I was trying to figure out what kind of investor am I? What kind of investor do I want to be? And on the broadest scope, the, the highest level thinking, there really are four kinds of investors. There are passive investors, value investors, growth investors, and active investors. And passive investing is just index fund investing. Pick a simple low cost S&P 500 or total stock market index fund, don't try and time the market, buy and hold forever. And the founder of passive investing, in my opinion, is the, chair, the former chairman of Vanguard, and that is John Bogle. If you have not read his book, The uh, Little Book of Common Sense Investing, I highly recommend it just so that you're aware, just so that you understand the benefits of index fund investing. For probably 90% 90, 90 of people, this is their best chance to creating serious wealth over their lifetime. And the most famous value investor of all time, of course, is Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett likes to say, market prices are set by herds of emotional, greedy, or depressed persons who do not always act rationally. However, Warren Buffett does not advocate to uh, ordinary people to do value investing. He's obviously an advocate for certain companies or certain stocks, but he himself has said that the average investor should just be a passive investor, follow J uh, Jack Bogle's model. He says by periodically investing in an index fund, the know-nothing investor can actually outperform most investment professionals. 
Paradoxically, when dumb money acknowledges its limitations, it ceases being dumb. So last year I struggled with this. I struggled with what I'm being told by the professionals, like, hey, just buy index funds, versus what I was learning about active investing. And I wanted to know, can I teach myself enough about the stock market to have confidence in what I'm doing? And can I control my emotions, specifically greed or fear, enough to make rational decisions uh, in my own best interest? And if you want to be an active investor, then you need to learn as much as you can about fundamental analysis, technical analysis, and qualitative analysis. And fundamental analysis is what is the book value of the company? You look at the trinity of uh, the financial statements that the companies put out every quarter. The income statement, the balance sheet, the cash flow statement. What is their earnings per share, their free cash flow, their book value per share, their profit margin, their return on equity, their debt to equity ratio. You need to really understand uh, the metrics of how a company is valued to know whether or not you're getting a good deal when you buy a, a stock. Technical analysis is when you look at the charts. You can read them with candlesticks, you can read them with trend lines, simple moving averages, do they have resistance, price floors, and ceilings? What is the trade volume of this stock? Maybe you might want to reference MACD, RSI, OBV, or look for Golden Cross or Death Cross events. But if you're not, if you're trading in the short term and you're not referencing the charts, you're basically going in blind. You don't have good chances. And then finally, qualitative analysis is the intangible. What can you say about the leadership of this company? Their product and service, is this an emerging industry? Do they have a competitive advantage? Are there any newsworthy events? Basically, what do Wall Street established investors not yet know about this stock? What do they not understand about this company? So active investing is really anything on a less than one year time horizon, anything in the short term day trading, swing trading, trading options, and the industry doesn't even call it investing. They call it trading, you're actively trading. And I'm gonna read this disclaimer before we go any farther in the video. But day trading, swing trading, and options trading is pure speculation. There is no guarantee. The more decisions you have to make, the more mistakes you can possibly make. Day trading, swing trading, options trading is the world's most high level competitive sport. There are Ivy League uh, graduates who do it, people who have 30, 40 years worth of experience doing it, and there's literally supercomputers with high sophisticated, high frequency trading algorithms that as soon as you jump in the arena and start playing this game with them, you have to really question what are your odds of, of out competing them in the short term. So we've established the difference between investing and trading. Investing is long term, less risk, more predictable, buy and hold. Trading is short term, more risk, less predictable, and you're getting in and out of positions frequently. And at the beginning of my brokerage account challenge, I tried swing trading, but in my opinion, it was too inefficient. It was going way too slow. The amount of decisions that I was having to make for very small gains, in my opinion, just didn't make it appealing to me, which is why I gravitated towards trading options. And I'll be honest, trading options is very confusing <laughs> and there's not really a good system for learning it. How I learned it was watching YouTube videos. So there's three channels that talk about trading options, In The Money, Project Option, and a guy named Brad Finn. I mostly learned trading options from these three channels. However, if you wanna learn trading options from me, I have a playlist for that. So currently my options trading playlist has 18 videos. I will be making more videos on more trading options topics. So this video playlist will be developing over time. And once I felt like I had a good grasp on trading options, I realized that there are six tools available to every investor or trader. And 95% of people, all they ever do is just buy stock. When they don't want to hold anymore, they sell it. But if all you do is ever buy and sell stock, you're, you're ignoring these other five tools available to you. Buying call or put options, selling put or call options, and short selling. Now, some of these are more risky than others, but some of them, like selling covered calls, are actually very conservative. 
But the options trading strategy that I've been doing the last two months is actually pretty risky, and that is buying call options. Options trading is a form of leveraging your money. When we look at all of my positions in my Fidelity account, my cost basis is $33,193. However, how much stock is my, am I controlling? One contract is uh, 100 shares. So how much worth of stock is my $33,000 controlling? And I'm controlling $534,000 worth of stock. Leveraging your money is pretty crazy. So now that you understand the basics of what I'm doing, people want to know, how did you do it? Can I do it too? And first I have to tell you that when choosing stocks, you need to be very selective, very picky. There are 2,800 stocks publicly traded on the New York Stock Exchange. I would never touch 95% of them. There really is only about 100 companies that I would be willing to do business with, willing to trade. And the analogy is picking stocks is like playing baseball where there are no strikes. You can stand at the plate and wait as long as you want for the perfect pitch before you, before you swing the bat. So if you could just wait for the perfect pitch, wait for the perfect stock, how long would you wait? There is no rush, there is no urgency. So what do I not trade? I don't trade foreign stocks. I don't trade IPOs or SPACs. I don't trade small caps or penny stocks. I don't trade pharmaceuticals, biotech companies. I don't trade companies that I don't understand. If I cannot explain to you in two sentences what this company does and how it makes money, then I'm not gonna touch that stock. Now for those people who buy and sell these stocks, I'm not saying you can't make money buying and selling them. Of course you can, lots of people do. However, for me personally and my system, I've decided to go with boring, very predictable stocks. When you look at my, uh, my, my holdings, it's very familiar large cap stocks, S&P 500 companies, Apple, Adobe, Dollar General, Costco, Lockheed Martin, Walmart. And this actually frustrates people. I've gotten comments in the section saying that I only buy boomer stocks, that I need to you know, pick up some Neo or some Palantir, and I don't see the need. I'm not saying you can't make money with those stocks, but based on the system that I have developed for myself, I want at least 10 years worth of financial statements that I can analyze and, and use as a projection. So for me, I only trade or buy call contracts on very stable, predictable, boring, large cap stocks. So let's now go through my system, what I look for as far as fundamental analysis, technical analysis, and qualitative analysis. And for fundamental analysis, the five basic things, there's lots that you can analyze and look over, but the five basic things that I, that I look for in a healthy, growing company is, is their revenue increasing? This is their total sales, how much raw money they bring into the company. Are they profitable every year? So this is their revenue minus their expenses. Are they staying positive as far as their earnings per year? Number three is, are their shares decreasing? Are they committed to doing stock buybacks? Number four is, is their price to earnings value low compared to where it's been valued in the past? Number five is their price to free cash flow value low compared to the past. What website do I use to check all this? There are lots of websites that you could potentially use. I like using a website called macrotrends.net. I do it because it's free, I don't even need a login, and they have very good visuals. So as an example, let's look at Adobe. Uh, this is a company that I recently bought a call contract on. And let's go through my five criteria as far as uh, fundamental analysis. So first one for revenue, you'll see that we have their quarterly revenue uh, statement, and then their trailing 12 months. So this is the last four quarters combined. Is Adobe, uh, is their revenue increasing, especially in the last five years? And yep, Adobe's doing pretty good. Next, we can go to net income and we can check out their profitability, revenue minus their expenses. And yes, uh, their quarterly revenue is pretty good. Occasionally there will be blips where it'll go down negative and th they could have negative earnings in a quarter or a year, maybe because they made uh, an acquisition or something was depreciated. So this one isn't as important as revenue growth, but it's still nice to see this being positive quarter after quarter. 
Next, we'll click on Shares Outstanding. And once again, you want companies that do stock buybacks. You want the value of existing shares to increase in value over time because they're buying back or destroying, destroying shares. So Adobe doesn't do uh, an aggressive amount, but you can see that over time, the number of shares in existence does go down for Adobe. Next at the top, we'll click on price ratios. And for price ratios, uh, this is their price to earnings. So how much are you paying for the current stock price per dollar of earnings? And you want this to be lower. You wanna pay less money. So uh, in the past, w w with each company, they're, they're all valued differently. So an insurance company is valued differently from a bank, which is valued differently from a software company, which is valued differently from a car company. So it's hard to say a general rule of thumb, what is a good PE ratio? The industry will like to say 20, you don't want something above 20, but certain companies like Adobe are almost always above 20. So Adobe would never be a buy if you were just saying PE ratio can't be above 20. So what I like to do is look at Adobe's current PE and look at where it was valued uh, in the past. So Adobe's price ratio has been as high as 152, but you can see that it's, it's predictably been in the 40s or 50s, as high as 57 in 2008. So where is it currently valued? It's currently only valued at 45. Once again, lower the better. The final metric that I look at is more important than PE, and this is price to free cash flow. Free cash flow is money coming in, money coming out. Free cash flow is what companies use to issue dividends, buy back stock, pay down debts, uh, and, and make acquisitions. So free cash flow is very important for a company to grow or, or uh, proof that they're profitable, more so than their earning statement. So the ratio of price to free cash flow, once again, it's different for every industry, uh, different for different stocks. So it's important to look at a company and then, and then uh, compare it against its past, which is why I like looking at this, uh, this spider graph. So currently Adobe's price to free cash flow is 43, which is higher than it's been historically. In 2014, it was at 37, 37. However, last summer, uh, August, it did shoot up to 50. So it is lower than it was uh, about nine months ago. Next up is technical analysis. And these are the five things that I look for when doing technical analysis. Number one is, is the stock in a downtrend? If a stock is trending down or in a free fall, don't buy it. Wait for it to bottom out and uh, achieve some kind of equilibrium before you choose to buy in. Number two is, does the stock form nice support and resistance lines? <clears throat> Once you start looking at stock charts, you'll just magically start seeing them. They often form around uh, nice round numbers like 100, 150, 2000, 2500. Number three is, is the stock well rested? Is it consolidating sideways? This is where the stock price starts just moving sideways within a certain range or a channel. And when a stock is well rested for three months, six months, nine months, a year, that usually means as long as revenue is increasing that the stock is due for a breakout. And as soon as it starts a new uptrend, that is the perfect time to buy that stock or buy a call contract on that stock. And then number five is, are the moving averages lined up? The 20 day, 50 day, 100 day, 200 day moving averages. Once all four line up in order, that's a good indication that the stock is going to continue trending upwards in the near future. Once again, we can look at Adobe as a good example, and you'll notice that the red line is the 20 day moving average, the orange is the 50, the blue is the 100, and the purple is the 200. It's been, it's been perfectly, almost perfectly lined up for basically uh, the last five years. But when you start looking for it, you will start seeing these price support and resistance lines. So at around 250 a share, Adobe traded sideways. It traded sideways for about four or five months. It then had a breakout to about 300, hit a resistance, and then uh, shot up to where it's been almost the last nine months, and that is 450. So if we zoom in and we check out this last uptrend that occurred for Adobe last spring, last summer, what happened was Adobe hit $500 a share, and then it, it, it hit this resistance line 
there was a sell-off. It gets down to about 450, it then bounces, goes back up to 500. It's just been ping-ponging back and forth between these nice round numbers of 450 and 500 the last nine months. However, when it hits uh, below 450, it hit 425, a new breakout started. Because this stock was so well rested and consolidating sideways for nine months, revenue was still increasing in that time period, so the valuation of the company caught up. Look at this purple line, the 200-day moving average for the stock price. As soon as Adobe's share price fell below that, basically investors saw this as an indication that it was time for it to start uptrending. So it's punched through the $500 barrier and it's now in a breakout. Where is Adobe's stock price going to go in the next week or two, three weeks? Uh, it's probably going to hit 550, if not 600. It's then going to hit a new price resistance line uh, and then start channeling or trading sideways again. Another good example is Amazon. Amazon was in an uptrend until it hit about $1,000 a share. It then traded sideways for four or five months. It then was in another breakout until it hit 2,000. There was a sell-off. It bounced off 1,500, went back up to 2,000, traded sideways for over a year. And as soon as it was able to break through 2,000, it was off to the races until it hit a nice round number of 3,000. And Amazon has been trading sideways. It's been consolidating uh, for almost nine months, similar to how Adobe was. However, what the stock price, what investors are waiting for is they're waiting for these moving averages, the 200-day and the 100-day, to get closer to where the current share price is, and then it'll have another breakout. It'll start uptrending again. What's a good example of a stock that I would not trade, and that is Amgen. This is a biotech company. Look at this stock chart. There's, there's so much order and predictability when trading stocks like Adobe or Amazon, and a, co a company like Amgen is just chaos. If, if the stock chart looks like this in any way, don't trade this stock. The last thing to factor in is qualitative analysis. And this is just what is going on in the world. I went heavy into buying call contracts the last two months because a $2 trillion stimulus package was passed by Congress. The vaccine rollout's going pretty well. Things are opening back up. April traditionally has been the best performing months for stocks anyways. Additionally, with qualitative analysis, you can just do a Google, nurse, Google News search on the company and, and see if they have any news that might help the share price in the near term. So in a nutshell, that's how I did it. I explained to you the basics of what I look for with a call contract or buying stock in general. Can you do it too? I give no guarantees. Uh, that's up to you. Once again, you have to be able to make rational decisions and <clears throat> not be prone to hype not give in to emotion, and uh, just, just go by the numbers, go by the math, follow the charts. Okay guys, if you enjoyed this video, give me a thumbs up so the algorithm knows it's good. In addition, if you have any comments or questions, I covered a lot in this video, let me know down below. I will help you as always, if I can. Till the next video, take care.